Engineers really need to know their loads. It's more than just the load that's applied to the structure, as different loads have different probabilities, which means that you need to apply different safety factors. So let's break down the types of loads that can apply to your structure. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. See, loads are really important to structural engineers, as they're how we design our structures. But there's many different types of loads, and a lot of the time, it's not as easy as you may think, as there's a lot of statistics gone into it to based on the different design loads that we need to consider. The more uncertain the load is, the higher the factor of safety. So what types of loads are there? Let's break it down. Let's break down the different types of loads that you need to consider. Each code will consider them slightly differently, but the definition and the terms of them are very similar. So we have dead load, live load, environmental loads, and robustness. These are a combination of the self-weight, the types of elements that you're attaching to the structure, materials that are coming in and out of the building, and environmental factors such as wind and earthquake. These are all impacting the design that you need to have on your structure, and with different levels of certainty will determine how high that load actually is. So let's start off with the basics and break down dead load. Dead load is load that is applied to the structure on a permanent basis. So you think about things like the self-weight, so the designs of the beams that you have in the structure, the concrete flooring, you might even be the cladding, the windows, other elements that you can't easily move in and out of the structure. So they're really defined, you know what you've applied to the structure. A lot of the time it can also be permanent things such as MEP or other aspects such as partition walls. These all fall into a permanent load factor. As you really know what they are, as you've designed from the start, there's a very low uncertainty about how high that load will be. But it does not mean that you need to design for a factor of one. Many codes apply it differently, but in Australian standards, you're applying about a 1.2 times factor. Now, when you look at the other codes, they also apply a similar factor on these type of permanent actions. Due to the level of uncertainty being low, it means that you don't need to increase it more because it's statistically known what that load is. But you still want a little bit of fat in there just in case they've applied additional loads or made some substitution to that load. So it means that you have a little bit of leeway on if people apply a little bit higher loads in those areas. Live loads, on the other hand, are loads that are actionable, things that can move in and out of the structure. You're thinking about people, you're thinking about chairs, tables, the components behind me. These are all different types of live load. Even the computers and the desks that are very easily moved in and out of the structure, these are considered live load. As you don't have a lot of control over them, the uncertainty is very high. With a high uncertainty means that you need a higher factor of safety on these loads as they could either be a lot higher or they could be a lot less. Most codes provide you with a minimum live load factor that you need to design for. If there's no real definition in the code, you can't really calculate it, you've got to really make a guess. So in a residential structure, it will be typically your lowest level, where something like an office block can be two to three times higher than your residential building. And even commercial spaces, you even break it down to different types of actions, such as if you've got theater halls, if you've got gathering areas. These will all have different loads applied to them based on codified requirements. So when you think about live loads, think about what's in the code, what load do I need to apply? And just because these loads are very uncertain, means there's typically a higher factor of safety applied to them. I'd just like to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, Geeks Outfit, who's kindly supplied this t-shirt and got a special offer for you. See, they supply t-shirts for people like us who love engineering and maths, but they'll be offering 25% discount to anyone that can use the link in my below description. It helps support the channel, but also gets you a nice piece of clothing. For example, in Australian standards, we apply a 1.5 factor, but in many other codes, such as in the US, they apply a 1.6. Now, it's not just those two loads combined. So if we're doing a gravity load assessment of the structure, typically we have two different factors. We either do the 1.35 times the dead load, or we do like a 1.2 plus 1.5 times the live load. So we've got this factor that's amplifying the load that's applied to our structure. Another thing that you may not consider, especially the live load, as there's a high uncertainty. So if you have a large column on a lower floor, supporting a lot of floors above it, there's a lot of tributary area. So it means you can apply an additional reduction factor on that column on the lower floor. You can typically reduce that live load, which is called live load reduction. Now you do need to be careful with this, as there are certain live loads that cannot be reduced, but most of them can be. So it means that you can apply an additional factor of safety on that column at the base. But it does not mean if you're designing a single beam, you shouldn't reduce that, as it's very highly likely that potentially you have one floor that's fully loaded. So a single beam would need to be designed with a full live load or something like a column or a wall at the base, you may be able to have a reduction in the live load force that's applying to it. Now, just because you are reducing it does not mean that you don't need to apply that 1.6 or 1.5 times factor of safety. 
You're just applying it on the reduced live load that you've applied to the structure. Environmental loads is one of those things that can be quite hard because there's a lot of different factors that go into it. But these environmental factors can be things like earthquake, wind load, snow load, or even ponding of water in the wrong situation. So for example, if you've got places that are considered have snow impact, and typically this is defined in the code, you potentially need to design for an additional load on any structure that's outside to apply for the load that may be applied from the snow action that's applied to it. You can also have wind-driven snow that's applying a lateral force to your structure where the snow is piled up on one side, applying a lateral force to try and push the building sideways. Now, this is typically not that high, but it's something you need to consider in the wrong situations. Somewhere with a lot of high snow loads may actually impact the design of many elements of the structure that are external to the structure. Where things like earthquake and wind, they're a different factor. A lot of the time you need to make sure that your structure is robust enough during an earthquake event or wind event to stand up to the actions that apply to them. Now the problem with wind and earthquake, it's a statistical problem. You see, you don't have one wind load. So you can design for a one in a hundred year storm or one in 200 year storm or one in a 500 year earthquake. The codes will apply based on how critical the structure is, depending on how high an earthquake you need to design for. So the more critical the structure is, the more people that will be impacted, typically you need to design for a higher level of event in those situations. And for example, especially something like a hospital or a police station, they need to be designed for the highest level of safety. So typically they need to be designed for the biggest earthquakes or wind loads that may be applied in the area, as they're the last things that you want to pull down. Basically you want everything else to be damaged or collapsed at this point, as you need the emergency services to come up and mop up after an event. You don't want your hospital falling down during a big earthquake as that's when the biggest intake of people need to come. So typically things that are needed post disaster are designed for the highest level of safety compared to a normal structure. Don't I want my residential building to be designed for that? But the chances of a one in a thousand or one in 2000 year event are very unlikely. And if you design every structure for that, think about how heavy the structure will be and how much waste you're potentially putting in it. It's an event that may or may not happen. Yes, some people can determine that you design for a high level of safety, but it's something that's considered to be unnecessary due to how unlikely such events would occur. It's something that the general populace may not think. When they design a building, it will always stand up. But underneath a big enough event, it could be catastrophic. There's a lot of buildings in their entire lifetime will never ever see such a big event. That brings up a good point, especially when you're looking at environmental factors. The design life of the building can also impact how big a factor of safety you need to have on those earthquake or wind loads. The longer the building is in place, typically the higher level of factor of safety you need to apply as it's opening the window for the percentage of seeing that event actually occurring. So if you typically have a normal building that's only around for about 50 years, like most residential buildings, you'll have a lower factor of safety if someone wants to design their building for 100 years. And it's twice the period of time, means you're twice as likely for bigger events to occur means that it raises up the bar that you need to design these loads for. So these are all on a Bell statistic curve average. So you're averaging out what type of factors that you have. This combined with both the material factor of safety plus the load factor of safety are superimposed on top of each other. So that means based on these Bell curves underneath the wrong considerations, you could potentially have a building fall down where no one has done anything wrong. As you've got one factor of safety where the material is actually weaker than you thought it was, you could narrow factor of safety where the loads were actually higher than the material factor of safety, you could potentially have a catastrophic event. Now, it's the superposition of both these statistics to make sure that not more than about one in a million or so buildings will fall down underneath the wrong conditions. But it's not like we see that many buildings fall down. Now, this is also where you have the biggest problems when you're talking to builders, as they've potentially done some dodgy stuff in the past, but they haven't had any problems with it. Because of the superposition of these factors of safety it means most of the time you'll have a building that is stronger than you thought it was and a load that was lower than you thought it was. So they have a big margin of error before something goes wrong. But you don't want to make sure that you're reducing that factor of safety below what the codified needs. So just because someone's done it in the past doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And it's always good at educating other people about why we need this factor of safety and how underneath the wrong conditions it could go catastrophically wrong. As we were talking about before, we brought it up a little bit briefly, but loads are combined into a load combination factor. So you potentially have two different load combination factors. You have what a serviceability state and you have an ultimate state. So what is a serviceability state? A serviceability state is typically when the building would see cracking. So typically if you're designing the building for serviceability, you shouldn't see any damage. The building should be completely functional up until that loading. So it means no major cracking, no major damage. The building looks good. 
where you have an ultimate limit state. It's the design load that the building cannot fall down from. The building doesn't need to be very pretty, but it needs to allow the occupants to leave the building after it sees such an event. So both these factors have different types of design considerations based on either a lateral design or a gravity design to combine together based on the statistical averages. As we said about dead load, it's highly known what the level of certainty of a dead load is. So because of that, it has a lower factor of safety. So in most codes, it's typically somewhere between 1.2 to 1.4, depending on where you are in the world. You just need to look up the codes to find out what that factor is. Whereas live loads with a lower confidence, it's somewhere between like 1.4 to 1.6. Again, look up your local standards. Due to the level of uncertainty, you typically have a higher factor of safety on those live loads. Snow loads, again, is typically one of those things where you've got a typically a 1.2 to 1.6 times multiplier on it, as it's very uncertain. As you have no control over the amount of snow or drifts that may form, or how big a snow event you have, you typically need a factor of safety on top of the snow load to make sure it considers those extreme situations, so you don't have a catastrophic event under the wrong conditions. Wind loads is one of those things where you look into the code, and the code will define what factor of safety you need to apply. In most wind loads, you'll typically have a service wind load, and an ultimate wind load, which will have a different wind speed that you need to design for. SLS wind speed is normally a 1 in a 50 year event, where ULS wind speed can be upwards of a 1 in 500 year event. So it can be a significant increase from your SLS to your ULS. There's also a simplification of the loads as you don't want to go into a wind tunnel every single time. But on those bigger structures such as towers, you potentially do, as there can be significant savings from doing a wind tunnel test. By testing your building beneath the right conditions, you can have a reduction of upwards of 20% below code, and sometimes even more underneath the right conditions. And a lot of people go into shaping the building about how you can actually reduce the wind loads by shaping the building in the correct way. Because it's not just the building itself with the shaping that may affect it, but also the buildings around it can have a significant impact, either positive or negative. It's underneath the wrong conditions, wind loads can be quite dicey, I've had a situation where I had a wind load increase from code to 150% because of the shape of the building. It negatively impacted my wind design. So especially on critical structures that are super tall that are hard to judge, making sure that you're getting those wind tunnel tests to make sure you're applying the right actions to your building. Earthquake loads, again, are similar to wind loads, but they're based on the definition of where you are and the subsoil conditions underneath you and how stiff your building is. Typically as well, in critical locations where you have high earthquake loads, you will have that SLS earthquake load, which will be lower, and you'll have the ULS earthquake load that will be higher. But these are based on a probability of your structure, where it's located, what occupancy level does it have? Is it a single family dwelling? Is it a multifamily dwelling? Or does it have a high rise aspect to it? So multiple apartments. So depending on what your building's used for, will significantly impact the loads that you apply in the earthquake situation. And they're based on a return period. So 1 in 500, 1 in 1,000, 1 in 2,500 years will determine how big an earthquake you need to design for based on statistical average. And the more often you see earthquakes in a given area, the more often that load could potentially be updated. So make sure you're always keeping up with the latest codes. Something I haven't talked about much though is what we call robustness loads. What are robustness loads? Robustness loads are loads that are applied to the structure in case of a catastrophic event. So typically bigger buildings, what you can't have is have one element come out have multiple floors come down beyond it. Great example of this is Ronan Point, which had a catastrophic event where you had one floor at the bottom blow out and every floor above it come down. This was deemed unacceptable due to the level of damage was disproportionate to the amount of damage that was actually received. So now there's minimum design factors where you need to tie the building in with a minimum of 5% between each element. So it means that in those extreme events where you might have something blow out, you will have a load path that won't be very pretty, but will hold the structure together allowing people to evacuate before a catastrophic event actually occurs. So these are the additional loads that you need to typically apply to connections, typically need to have good detailing, especially in reinforced structures, to have continuous reinforcement lapped together to make sure you have a load path that's alternative to the one that was intended. It does not need to be pretty, it just needs to not fall down. So this is where the code will typically apply a 1.5%, a 2.5%, or potentially even a 5% on different elements. So it doesn't matter what the demand is, you need to design it for a specific load to make sure that it doesn't overcome that factors. Another thing that you may have missed is particularly in lapping or joining structures together, typically there's a minimum design load that you need to design that connection for beyond what demand is. The demand will be less than the minimum design load that you need to design for. So it's just something to consider, especially when you're looking through the different codes. Now you will need to potentially go into the concrete code, the steel code or the timber code to see what those minimum factors are. 
And sometimes the code doesn't lay it out specifically. And depending on the type of structure, it may actually change. And this is where you can look at things like hierarchy of strength or capacity design. For example, in seismic areas, if you've got a beam that's acting in seismic actions, there's a minimum capacity you typically need to design for shear forces. As you typically want a structure to fail flexurally instead of in shear, the shear is brittle, instantaneously, and potentially catastrophic. Reflexion will potentially bend and soften the structure over time, allowing people to see the damage where it is or for it to allow for it to find an alternative load path before the catastrophic event actually occurs. So depending on how you're designing your structures, it's something that you need to be careful of. Have you looked at capacity design? Have you looked at robustness? And what are those minimum design factors that you need to consider? Loads and load paths are very related to each other. So I've got a link to a video here about something you may know about engineering that make your designs better, more efficient, and bring your engineering to the next level. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. Keep learning, and I hope to see you next week. Bye.